Hi everyone, we'll get, get, we'll get going in a few minutes. Is the mayor planning on attending today? I believe so. Okay. Okay, well, the time is now 1.30, so we're going to get uh, moving along with our Community Growth and Infrastructure Standing Committee meeting. Um, I'm the vice chair of this committee. Uh, Councillor Watkins is away on uh, holidays right now and uh, asked me to, to in on him. I think from our committee, we for sure have Wes Broadhead. And uh, hi, Wes. Myself, um, Ken McKay, who is not on the committee, but um, a welcome uh, attendee is here and I'm just looking for the mayor. Which I, is she here? Is she on the, our list yet? Not yet. She is not yet. Uh, she did uh, accept the invitation those were expecting her. Well, we just saw her at the lovely raising of the Métis flag and she did confirm her attendance. So I imagine she's rushing back to her desk as we yes. speak. <laughs> so we'll just give her a second here. Anyway, we can call the meeting to order. The time is 1.31 on my watch. Uh, attendance, as I said, um, Wes and I, and uh, hopefully the mayor in a moment to provide us with quorum. Um, first, I'll call for the adoption of the agenda. So moved by Wes Broadhead. I moved that the August 24th, 2020 Community Growth and Infrastructure Standing Committee meeting agenda be adopted as presented. Thank you. Um, do we have any, uh, looking at ledge, do we have any um, presentations or appointments signed up? I have nothing on my agenda. No, we do not. Great, okay, thank you for that. Um, moving on to number five, uh, approval of the minutes. I did notice one change and that's that uh, I think I'm uh, listed there as present and it was July 13th and I for sure was off the grid fishing in a boat. So I know I wasn't there. So uh, that was the only change that I could see. Okay, we'll make that change. Thank you. Any other changes to the minutes that anybody could see? If not, can I please have a motion to approve the minutes? Wes? <laughs> All right, uh, that the Community Growth and Infrastructure Standing Committee meet, uh, minutes of July 13, 2020 be adopted as amended. Thank you. All those in favor? Carried, and I believe the mayor is there, um, but I can't actually see your lovely face on my screen. I am here. Excellent, and I'm sure that you approve the uh, mm -hmm. approval of the minutes as amended. Perfect. Uh, we're moving on now to new business number six, and that is development bonds. Mr. Scoble, is there a presentation by uh, John Reed? Uh, yes, we have engineering on, and I'll, I see John there. So, yeah, I assume he's Great. presenting. That's correct. Oh, John. Thank you. 
Uh, I'm ready to present. Uh, Lola, can I get the screen to set up a presentation? You can start your screen share. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes, we can. Yep. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Reed, Manager of Development Engineering, and I'll be going over the recommendation to, of uh, introduction of the use of development bonds for the City of St. Albert. So uh, I'm going to pre preface this with the start of this presentation as a repeat of the, the one I gave on the June 8th uh, COVID-19 Recovery Task Force meeting uh, for those council members who are not present at that meeting. Um, and the second half of the presentation deals with the proposed document changes that were required from that. So a quick overview of what will be discussed uh, includes uh, what does the city currently use for development securities? Um, why do we need to introduce a new, new option? Um, what are development bonds? The recommended changes to existing council policies and previous council motions. Um, what we did with stakeholder engagement, uh, implications of the recommendations, alternatives that were considered, and then the final recommendations. So our current securities options, um, are used to ensure that if a developer defaults on the contractual obligations with the city um, within a development agreement, uh, the city has the option to use those funds to complete the work that was intended. Um, and uh, currently for securities, the, the city uses either cash, certified check, or letter of credit through an accredited bank. The letter of credit is in the city's name um, that we were able to draw on as agreed upon in the development agreement. And these forms of security are quite liquid and in the city's favor at a very low risk option for the city. So while the current forms of security are very low risk for the city and an acceptable practice in the industry, there's been a push to use an alternative form of security. Um, the reason for this is that developers must put up 100% value of forward of the current types of available security. With the length of a development, this could uh, mean that it could take up to five years for the developers to have all of their funds returned to them uh, that the city is holding for security. As new agreements are entered, this requires more upfront capital every time and reduces the available capital that the developers have to invest with. As COVID-19 has stifled home buying, there is a hesitation for developers and other builders to build in new areas. If the use of development bonds is allowed, this will free up the developer's capital and help them push for more options with regards to their developments. With the developments, buying, uh, with the developments being built, the city's tax base uh, increases. This can be seen as a win-win situation for developers and the city. Another reason to follow this path is to increase our competitiveness in the region. Um, city of Edmonton has just introduced this option earlier in the summer uh, as a pilot program and the city of Calgary and city of Grand Prairie are already uh, doing this. It's important to note that there's a definite attractiveness for developers to not have to have their cash flow tied up in letters of credit as this will allow res a less requirement upfront for capital to get their developments done. So development bonds are more like an insurance policy that allows the developer to pay a fee to a surety bond company that will give them funds, to, that will give the funds to the city if the developer defaults on their contractual obligations. While, this, there, while there is some extra risk to the city to use this type of security, it is minor. And the language that the city of Edmonton currently uses has already developed mitigating uh, mitigations uh, for most of those risks. The benefits to developers in doing this are that they do not have to have all their funds available in cash for security for their development. With the development, the security is also tied up for numerous years and reduced over time. Developers did not need this need to have this included, and they would have more capital funds available for further developments. So I did a little chart here. Um, with all forms of uh, security are quite liquid in the sense that the cash is in the hands of the city within the agreed upon notices. Our letter of credit currently indicates five business days notice to the developers prior to the drawing of the funds, while the current city of Edmonton language notes seven days for the surety bond company. And I can uh, probably assume that we could change that to five business days, which would make more sense. Um, the developer does not need to put up as much capital at the start of the development and therefore has more cash on hand. The big payoff for developers now is allowing them to swap out their existing letters of credit. So there's a lot of developers out there right now that do have uh, current existing letters of credit that would like to swap those out and could be a big savings for them and a big cash influx to the city potentially. 
no matter which method is used, the same process would be followed out on the administrative side. So there are no extra costs or time in the long run. The city does have or does do a, comp, a complete review of the developers. The city does not do a complete review of the developers' finances to see if they have the viability to complete their obligations to the agreements. And the city, city takes the security as a whole to ensure the work is completed. Surety bond companies will review their financial acumen in order to ensure the risk is mitigated for the surety company. So they will do a full review of the, the company that's applying. And it can be expected that not all developers will be able to ob obtain surety bonds. This is a level of review the city does not complete and will mitigate a lot more risk to the city by allowing the use of the bonds. As only financially available, viable developers will be able to obtain a development bond. While there's little to no risk in each category for the city, it can be noted that the risk with, uh, that there is still risk with using bonds. The risk here would be that the bonding company defaults at the same time as the developer defaults. While not unheard of uh, for one or the other that defaults, it is quite highly unlikely and rare that they would both default at the same time. So here comes our recommendations. So the first recommendation, recommended change would be to the council policy CP&E 03 letter of credit security uh, is to be updated and renamed to the uh, council policy CP&E 03 development security as there would now be four potential options for security as noted previously in the presentation. The new name would, not, would be more generic in dealing with development uh, conditions. There are multiple changes noted in the draft document that was available to the committee in full package for this recommendation. And these changes add the language of adding development bond as an option for developers to use. Recommended change number two would be that the amendment of council policy CCAO01 chief administration of administrative officer delegations for the removal of the language requiring that the administration are required to use the standard template for development agreements. As the development industry is uh, ever evolving in these times, there is a need for the city to adapt to these changes without requirements to come back to council for changes to the template. The city's administration are, are planning to continue to still use that template uh, as a standard, but are looking for some flexibility on amending the document for unique development situations, such as uh, amendments that will need to be made for the document that would allow the use of development bonds as a form of security, allowing deferred offsite levy payment options for private rec recreation amenities, and making improvements to the CCFAC process for development. These functions are administrative in nature and administration is seeking the ability to be responsive to change when appropriate. By doing this, council would still be responsible for the decisions and approval of the major items that shape the document, like the security policy, offsite levy bylaw, and planning decisions throughout the ASP approval. The document itself is there to facilitate the agreement with the developer in the city. And as such, any substantive changes would also have to be approved by the development industry as they are co-parties to the agreements. And the documents will also receive a full legal review prior to the city administrative, administrative officer signing. Uh, like with recommendation number two, the same reasons uh, just stated, administrative, administration is looking to rescind council motion C95-2016. It states that the development agreements as attached one and two on the February 22nd, 2016 agenda report entitled Standard Development Agreement Template, Final Engagement Feedback, be approved for the use as the city's new standard form of development agreements. Um, and the reason for rescinding it, like I said, was for the, the uh, same kind of uh, requirements as was in recommended change number two. Uh, both of those give us the flexibility to amend the standard agreement uh, in certain situations. So for community, sta uh, community stakeholder and communications engagement, uh, the administration was already looking at bringing in development bonds forward. The UDI committee for St. Albert requested formally to allow the use of these development bonds following the city of Edmonton's footsteps. As part of the work the city of St. Albert is doing with Edmonton, they have allowed administration to use their document for the same purposes. This would be the same documentation that had already been previously reviewed through the UDI main chapter in Edmonton, uh, including indicating that there's support from development community moving forward in this direction. With allowing administration some flexibility in how it addresses unique scenarios within the standard development agreement template without requiring to bring those items to council for approval will also be well received from the development community. So implications on these recommendations. So financially, the city of Edmonton is already accepting development bonds and it's critical that the city move quickly to adopt a similar policy so that developers see that they are not being negatively impacted by working in the city of St. Albert. This is especially true given the uncertainty of development with regards to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic and the changes for this region's growth and development to slow, potentially impacting future taxation capabilities. From a legal and risk perspective, as noted previously in the development bond 
um, it, they act in the same way as a letter of credit and legal sees no overall risk differential to any other acceptable form of security we currently use. For a program or surfers service viewpoint, it is anticipated that these changes will result in a higher level of satisf satisfaction with developers in the area and will potentially give developers more working capital to further develop within the city. Also being able to address one-off developer scenarios and development agreements will condense the agreement approval timeline and streamline some, some processes, which is also supported by the development industry and is a goal of some of the other council priorities. Organizationally, the only change internally would be the time required for converting existing letters of credit to development bonds, which the city will set out certain dollar values for which the changes can be, uh, which can be changed, as to not cause a flood of requests immediately and is to be handled once construction season ends for this, for this year. So alternatives and, and implications considered. So alternatives were considered um, as the request just uh, just to give some, some alternative options here. Alternative one would be only receive the agenda report as information. This would allow, uh, would not allow the city to proceed with the use of development bonds and keep the development agreements as it currently does. This may be perceived that the city is less competitive or attractive and could stall development in the city compared to the development in the neighboring communities. Alternative two, approve the changes to the council policy CPE 03, which would allow the use of development bonds in the policy only and not approve changes uh, CCA01 uh, and council motion C95-2016. That's recommendations two and three. Um, not go ahead with those and, and go ahead with recommendation one. This would mean administration would need to come back with the proposed changes to the development agreement back to council for review and approval, which could uh, result in delays for new developments. Uh, both alternatives are not recommended as they will result in difficulties for the development community to work in St. Albert and at higher costs. So down to the final recommendation is that the committee recommend, well, administration re recommends that the committee recommend to council to approve all the three recommendations in the agenda report. This is a win-win situation for developers in the city. There's little risk to the city allowing this to go forward. Um, there are no extra costs for administration to allow this to proceed. The city would be following larger cities and would also be ahead of some of the other smaller municipalities, giving the city an economic edge in jumpstarting the economy. Is it anticipated that we'll be using the same using the steps the city of Edmonton has followed? And it is also recommended to allow developers to convert their current letters of credit into development bonds with some limitations and parameters to be considered as part of the amendment. A staggered timeline is anticipated and to be supported by uh, to complete the conversion of existing LOC to bonds with the existing resources. And that is it. Any questions? Thank you, John. Um, I'm just gonna get my screen back up. Um, there you are, John. We didn't see you before. <laughs> All right. We're freaked out. Um, so that's good. Uh, glad to see your smiling face. I'm gonna open this up for questions now. Councillor Broadhead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, okay, so a, a couple of questions. Uh, appreciated the presentation. Uh, the the particular graph around risk uh, uh, mitigation and and how they were contrasted about was particularly helpful. So the whole idea here is that um, the city is protected, but we're still um, engaging in a risk mitigation strategy. It's just not backed by cash now. It's backed by a uh, bonding company, correct? That is correct. Okay. So now under legal risk here uh, on page three of four of your report, it says, um, so this product has been tailored to function like a letter of credit. Uh, and if there's an uh, deficiency, payable bond upon demand. Okay. And then in the next one, uh, it, uh, next sentence, uh, the way they're set up is that you don't have to justify a claim to bonding company. I, can you just reconcile those two, uh, how this plays out? If we find a deficiency, how does it play out going forward? So usually what happens is the deficiency is noted uh, and we have to give notice that they have to correct the deficiency in a certain time frame. If they do not, then we, we hold the right to pull the funds and, and do the work for them on their behalf. Uh, so with the letter of credit, it's the same thing. We, we notify the, the company that they have the required 
they're required to do so, we'll draw on those funds and, and execute the work immediately. The same goes for a development bond. So we would notify the development bond company or the surety company and, and do the draw on that funds at that time. Uh, the requirement is that we don't have to provide the exact dollar amount at that time, but we can start pulling funds on it. And then we can reconcile after that fact for the dollar amounts that have been used. Okay, so I guess my question here is, okay, before it was the bank, you just drew on it, but now here's a bonding company and for them to pay out, now it's costing them. So is there a requirement then to justify your requirement to them to draw money? No, there is not a requirement. So it worked the same way as the letter of credit. We give them the notice that we need the funds and we draw on those funds immediately and uh and and or within seven days or, or give the seven days notice then we can draw on those funds after but the way it's written up is it's indicated that it, it has no requirement for us to provide any sort of information for why we're pulling on those funds okay fair enough so then uh the acquiring of a development bond from an approved surety company so this isn't just abc bonding company they have to be vetted by the city or is this a slate of, uh, of bonding companies that the region or the province uh, underwrites or how does that play out? So with Edmonton, they use a minimum rating of an A minus rating through the Canadian uh, required ones and the Alberta ones. So they, they post that list yearly and it changes potentially. So that's the same process as what we're going to be writing into our procedures. So we will, we're going to require them to have at least a my, minimum A minus rating uh, to allow that to give us the comfort knowing that they're not going to default and the bonding company is not going to go out of business the next day. Okay, fair enough. I appreciate the, uh, the responses. That was basically where I was hoping you were going for. The, uh, the second and third recommendation, um, somewhat a little bit more uh, philosophical for me. So if we have a policy in place that says this is a template that every uh, developer coming to the city of St. Albert has to abide by, and we say, yeah, that will be the uh, template going forward, but you know what, if you want something different, we can make that happen. How, how do we then ensure that all of our development companies um, are treated equitably, I guess? Uh, it's, it, to me, you have a policy, it, it, everybody's on the same playing field. Or is this a situation where we have a template, the city manager makes a determination and you've basically uh, set a precedent and then the template is changed for everybody going forward. How, how do you see that playing out? Well, I, I know there's a certain situations, let's say, um, an HOA or something like that's introduced and we don't have that in our standard template. So we can at least put things like that in there or add in clauses like that for unique situations uh, on an ongoing basis. And then there's a potential for change in the, the whole template at some point, but that has to have approval through the development community. And it's not just one developer at that time. If the template changes, it has to have buy-in from UDI. Every, every developer has to be in agreement with that. But I do see it as a potential for certain situations where there's a unique, uh, maybe unique aspect of that development that might necessitate a, a small minor change in the actual template. Okay. Um, how would you define minor then? Like I, w what I'm trying to understand is the threshold where, whereby a, a request for a change is made and uh, it's significant and council would in fact like to have a, a, a voice into the decision. But once we make this change, there's no requirement for council to have any input anymore. So I'm just wondering what, what is minor versus major and how do you define that? Yeah, it's a tough one to define. So right now, the way it's stated, if we were had to change a punctuation mark, we have to bring it back to council. So that's where the difficulty lies. Right. But, uh, with most of the major changes, those are things are going to get approved through ASP and other other avenues. So the, the, this documents more just the, the legal formality of the agreement itself and what they're going to be giving to us as part of the, the development that's going on. So it's hard to define that and what what would be a minor versus a major, but I'm sure that if there was something major enough, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be caught at the development agreement stage. It would be caught well before then. 
um, and would have Okay, fair enough. Uh, that's a responsible answer. Uh, maybe through to uh, our CAO then, uh, Mr. Scoble, are you comfortable with this change then to your administrative policy? Uh, sorry. Yes, I am. Um, I mean, you know, the example, one example used there was a homeowner association, right, an HOA. Um, you know, there's, some of the developers are interested in that arrangement, whereas some aren't. So right there, there's that flexibility that, you know, the base template doesn't include that. But if, if a particular developer wants to, uh, to have an HOA, we can readily kind of amend or, or addend, I guess, an addendum almost more than anything, add that into the development agreement. Okay, fair enough. Those are my questions, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Broadhead. Very good questions, and you uh, asked some of mine, so I'm going to move it over to Councillor Mackay. Councillor Mackay? Your hand is up. I see it. I've tried to unmute a couple of times. I apologize. Um, so can you hear me now? We can. Yeah, I, I, if you read lips, you would have heard my question. <laughs> Anyways, the, uh, the, I was just uh, congratulating Councillor Broadhead. I thought those were fantastic questions and, and he did ask several of uh, mine as well. Um, I guess just picking up on, on some of um, the responses, um, Jonathan, in, What's, so you're part of, I guess, one of the risks would be as if there was a rush by development companies to actually want to convert their lines of credit over to uh, surety bonds. Do we have a, a large number of uh, com companies uh, that are development companies that have their cash tied up in deposits or, uh, or would it be just a few? What, what's the risk there? So I'm just opening my, my sheet up right now. So right now for, a, for uh, letters of credit that we have over the value of $50,000, we have 86 of them on file right now. So uh, the way I set it up is to be around between 15 to 20 um, is my breakdown. So once the first group of them have been cleared off or the people have indicated they're willing to switch it, then we'd switch to the next lower dollar amount so that it's not bombarded and we would have a, a reasonable amount of time to, to deal with these. So what was the number you were looking at maybe like, I mean, in a sense, so would it be a specific number you would have that would be converted uh, or would you, would that be your benchmark? Yeah. So in, in total, all of them over 50,000, we'd give the option for, but uh, it starts off at 500,000, which there's 17 of that are over 500,000 right now. So is that significant though? So, I mean, you could, that, that was going to be my next question would be what would like, um, I mean, I'm obviously not familiar with uh, security bond providers and I don't know what premiums would be, but so I, what would be the, is that just primarily the benefit of it is that they just don't have to, they can acquire the bond and so they don't have to carry the whole entire li uh, line of like the whole cash cost. Uh, so they don't have to put down $500,000. It would actually be a portion of that and the security surety company would actually pick that up. Is there a, a large premium in that? There, the, yeah. Go ahead, sorry. Um, from the, the surety companies, uh, they've indicated that it's actually less expensive going with them than it is going with the bank fees for actually getting the letter of credit. So it actually works out in double benefit to the developer because it'll be cheaper for them to obtain the development bond um, cost-wise, and then their money isn't tied up at the same time. But realizing that's only for the higher level developers, they can get the rating of the A-. So would our, and I appreciate that was one of my questions I was going to ask because I mean, certainly there must be only a few uh, security bond providers that can carry large sums of money like that. So they would have to be a high, high rank, high rating. Um, is, do, do, would we have a limit in relation to how much it would be? Or would it be just limitless? Like, let's say somebody wanted to put one of those 17, com 17 that have 500,000, maybe they wanted, maybe there's a couple that are this couple of the development companies that are actually there's more than like they have two or three of those 500,000 would we would we just put a limit on there to protect our, our our risk a little bit 
Uh, I don't think that it would be a necessity just because the way that the development bond is written up, it would be a separate one for each individual um, situation. And we wouldn't be able to transfer from one project to another, the money yeah. that we would be able to collect off of those. So they're kind of isolated per project. So it wouldn't make any de uh, benefit to holding one and releasing others. Yeah, and that's kind of where I was kind of answering or asking my question. Would we, like, I mean, each project is a separate one. We wouldn't allow them to kind of come under one umbrella then? No. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Those are my questions. Appreciate the uh, um, whole conversation, though. Thanks. Um, Mayor Heron, do you have any questions? Thank you, uh, Chair Hanson, but I am good. Most of my questions have been answered, and I'm familiar with this, so thanks. Great. Um, I just had a couple of questions, and um, the guys really took most of my questions as well. But to be absolutely clear for those of us who are not planners and developers are in that industry, um, for every project, um, where a letter of, letter of credit exists that will be put over to a surety bond. These are different surety companies. I think this is a little bit of a follow-up on Councillor McCly's question. We're not just dealing with one surety bond company. We are de dealing with a number depending on the project. Is that correct? Uh, like the whole per project, it would go over to one specific uh, surety company, just like we have for our, our letter of credit. We have specific banks. Well, it's not our bank specifically, but that project would pull all the funds from one bank or put the funds in one bank. And in this case, for each project, they would put their funds with one surety bond company. Okay. So we, they wouldn't put pieces into different companies. I think it would become too costly for the developers to do that. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. Um, I want to say, um, John, I really appreciated attachment three. That was a nice little summary of, um, of the wins and the, the way that you set out the chart, which you, which you presented today. Um, in terms of some of the other municipalities that are moving in this direction, Calgary, Edmonton, Grand Prairie, is this kind of a big city thing or a bigger city thing, or is this just a, uh, a choice that a municipality has to do? It's a choice that we have to do, but uh, from discussions with uh, everyone in general, this, not to say they're right, but the United States uses development bonds 99% of the time and everywhere. Um, it's only slowly kind of making its way into Canada. And I do know talking with some of my other municipality co-patriots co that uh, some of them are looking towards doing this and they're just not there yet. So we're trying to get ahead of the, the wave that's coming in essence. Oh, well, that's good. And, and, and across the country, I'm assuming across our country. That's right. I, I had a webinar with Vancouver doing it uh, slowly starting up as well. Um, and then I think Toronto is starting it as well. So they are larger company or larger municipalities, but it's going to feed its way down and everyone's going to be requiring to do this pretty soon. And, and this is a, an opportunity for us to um, promote our green 2.0, green 2.0 as well. I mean, we can sort of tout that as um, a progressive, um, procedure in our in our municipality. Okay, well, thank you for that. If there are no more questions, I wonder if ledge services could, oh, Councilor Mackay, I was gonna say your hand hasn't been taken down, but you have another question. Yeah, I apologize. Yeah, I did. I, I just, just to follow up to your question, uh, Jonathan, so I mean, if this is such a great thing, I was gonna say cat's meow, but that would really be a aging myself. Um, why, why now? Like what's, What's the draw now? If is it just been something that's just new that's just been you know, that surety companies have looked at, or have or have they been pushing this for some time, and and developers been pushing this for some time? But so why why is Edmonton and Vancouver and Calgary and Lethbridge starting to look at it now? Like um, I think it was because the wording that was originally used and the stigma with surety companies, because previously it was that. Uh, the thought was that it would be impossible to get those funds out of a surety bond company just because of the the legal hurdles that you would have to get to prove that you had they they, they that you needed the funds for a specific item um, and now that they've rewritten their rules and they've written it in a way that's more favorable to the city it becomes more of an option for for all parties to use so uh, 
I know with banks, they're under, um, you know, we're protected if uh, there's some protection. What, what's our protection under for surety companies? Are they, I mean, you talked about it, if they defaulted, what, what um, uh, legislative or uh, re certification requirements, what, what are they, are they having to pay into insurance or how are, how are we protected if that happens? Let's say we have a project that's ongoing and the surety bond company goes out of business, whatever might happen. Um, okay. At that point in time, we would request from the developer to re-establish a new surety bond with a, an A minus rated company again. Okay. So, so that alleviates the risk there. Um, like I said in the presentation, the only situation where there's a, a big risk to the city is if the surety company goes down as well as the developer at the exact same time, which is not probably unheard of, but it's very low risk for that to happen. Um, and I'm just going to uh, say a, a story from what I heard from one of the other municipalities is one of their banks went down that they had their letter of credit with. And, and that situation, they, they didn't have any cash available and didn't get reimbursed for certain situations when the developer defaulted after that. So it, it can happen with banks still too. Yeah, probably more likely in the United States. But uh, I was just wondering, I, I mean, there must be some protection. I know in Canada, there are rules and regulations around uh, bank, banks and bank operations. But I was wondering if surety companies are under some sense of oversight as well. I'm not aware of that, but there might be. But I, I personally don't know that much of surety companies. Okay. If I may jump in, uh, Madam Chair, they are. Surety companies, like insurance companies, like banks, are subject to their own legislation. And there's a fairly strict set of uh, tests, you know, liquidity tests, stress tests that surety companies go through. And uh, that, that's how they get their ratings. And mm -hmm. so th this is one of the reasons why, certainly from my perspective, uh, yes, is it a little tiny bit more risky than a letter of uh, you know, an irrevocable letter of credit from a chartered bank, yes, but not much more because surety companies are very tightly regulated as to their financial soundness. So uh, we're, we're pretty confident. All right. Thank you very much. I figured we would, but I, I thought we should ask the question. So, so John, at the end of the day, we are freeing up um, capital cash for the developers so that they can uh, use that cash to develop more. If they choose to do so. So that's a positive. Um, in your attachment three, you talk about mirroring um, Edmonton. So yep. this this is going to be a five-year pilot, is that the idea? I, I didn't put it as a five-year pilot because I don't want us to stick with five years in case after two years it doesn't work out properly. I want it to be able to just pull the plug right away. Um, by saying it's a pilot, I feel like you almost have to let it run its course. Um, but in reality, every development takes about five years from start to finish to complete. So it, it will be kind of difficult to, to put it as a pilot. And I, I didn't really want to put that language in here because if it does go ahead like we think it will, then there's no reason to pull it. But if it does start going south, well, then we can pull it immediately if we need to. Okay, well, that's, that's good to know. Um, I guess there would be a point in time where council would the council of the day whoever that may be will want to know um how this is working out and i assume at some point in time administration will come back and say this was a good move for these reasons so i guess i put that out there as not a motion but uh that would probably be a good thing to do so um, I am looking around to my committee members to see if anybody wants to put forward these three recommendations. Mayor Heron. Thank you. Uh, so I will move, or sorry, Councillor Chair Hansen, we suggested um, that we also have a motion in there about a review. I think it'd be not a bad idea. What do you think? See where it could go. Um, maybe just number four that um, council be provided a review in two years time or at the end Q220, where are we, 2022? Or when John or Kevin have an appropriate, how long do you think it'll be to get a really good feel that this is the appropriate move? I think it would be, honestly, it would probably be about three or four years out just yeah. because the fact of the timing of, of duration, because 
Um, right now, we'd have, we could have some converted over, but start to finish, we'd like to see it happen. And uh, I would mean the ones, the development starting next year would be the ones that would be first starting to use this from the start. And then uh, all the way up until uh, at least CCC, maybe FAC, which is when their construction is complete. So that usually takes uh, two to three years uh, for their um, roadworks and things like that. So we might as well have it at that point in time. Uh, then we can see when the releases are actually happening. Q4 of 2024? Yeah, I'm just, David, all our, all our council policies are reviewed on a certain schedule. And I'm just looking at CP and E03 development security, the policy. Does it, does it, what do we do for, how often do we review these things? Uh, there's, it's not entirely uniform, but it's typically okay. either a three or four year review period for most policies. And it's not, doesn't say in the policy, does it? It often does. Uh, I don't think it does in this one. Though. No, I didn't see it. Okay. All right. I'll make it as a separate motion then. Perfect. All right. Okay. So let me read what I got here. Um, that revised council policy cp and e 3 development security provided as attachment one be approved. Oh, this, sorry, this is recommend to council. Uh, be approved. Uh, number two, that revised Council Policy C, CIO 01, Chief Administrative Officer Delegations provided as attachment to be approved. And that the following Council Motion C, 95-2016, be rescinded. And that reads that the development uh, agreements provided as attachments one and two to the February 22nd, 2016 agenda report entitled Standard Development Agreement Template Final Engagement Feedback be approved for use as the city's new standard for form development agreements. And Ledge, I'll throw in number four, that council policy C, P and E 03, development security um, be reviewed in two years time, be reviewed by council in two years time. Or maybe an update. I think review or provided an update. Either way, thank you. It's the same thing. It amounts to the same thing, I think. Yeah. Did Ledge get that? Yes, it is. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Merritt. Any opening, re I'll accept that. Any opening remarks? No, I just think, honestly, uh, it's nice to see that St. Albert's getting ahead of this game. Um, that, you know, it was a not just a request of the development industry, that the city was already considering it. and. This council has instructed our city manager to do everything we can to become competitive in the region. And this is just another way that we can become that more competitive and desirable place to invest. That's all I have. Anyone else? Councillor uh, Mackay or Councillor Broadhead? Who else has got his hand up? Does he? I can't see him. He's supposed to eat. Okay. And you're <laughs> the list. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Broadhead, please go ahead. Thanks. Uh, well, not much to add. Uh, certainly, I just wanted to also uh, echo the mayor's comments about one of the things that uh, we as a council want to do is to make sure we create an environment within our community for all of our businesses to flourish. And I think this is a progressive step, and we're seeing it not only in the larger cities, but it's moving across. Uh, the nation, and I think St. Albert is well positioned by adopting such a policy as this. I think the uh, the mitigated risk uh, by the bond uh, is uh, sufficient to the needs of the city, and I'm looking forward to uh, our development companies uh, coming to St. Albert in, uh, in uh, yeah, and to be successful here. So. Thank you for that. And I will just echo um, much of what has been said. I appreciate the um, agenda um, report and everything in it. Uh, I also appreciate the fact that uh, you're working collaboratively so well with UDI and developers, because honestly, um, development is a tough thing and it's best when we can collaborate um, on things that work. So uh, it's good for our city, it's good for our, our green uh, 2.0, um, whatever we call it, <laughs> what do we call it? Green tape 2.0. So um, 
happy to see that moving along. So we have uh, little buttons at the bottom. I'm going to call for the question um, and you can put a yes or a no because I can't see you all together. So uh, please register your votes. I think everybody's in. That is unanimous. So thanks for that. Uh, this was a short meeting. Um, we're adjourned. You're muted, Wes. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>